Welcome to Opless TV. Today I'm in New York at the Permal office, and that's a fund of hedge funds group with $23 billion under management. Now, Robert Kaplan is the chief investment officer, and he oversees all asset allocation for Permal. Robert, can you introduce your firm and tell us a little bit about yourself and your role? We are one of the uh, oldest fund of funds firms. We have our origins back in the early 1970s, and so we're now approaching our 40th anniversary in this business. We're also one of the largest fund of funds. We have, as you mentioned, $23 billion in, in assets under management. And we do this with about 190 employees worldwide in nine different offices that spread Asia, the Middle East, Europe, as well as North America. As you mentioned, I'm the chief investment officer. I oversee all asset allocation, manager research, portfolio monitoring, as well as sit on the, uh, the firm's investment committee. Rob, tell me about your personal history and how you came to work at Permal. I started my career as an accountant, and uh, I, I always knew I wanted to get into the in investment industry. And when I was in college and all my friends were deciding to major in finance, I, I decided to major in accounting. And, and the reason being was that I always thought that the best way to understand companies was to understand their financial statements. And so I chose accounting as my, my major. I wound up choosing Ernst & Ernst & Winnie at, at the time because it had the biggest financial services practice. And so I joined Ernst & Winnie in the, in the fall of 1988. I asked to be in the financial services office and I was assigned immediately to the asset management group. And so I covered asset managers, mutual funds, private equity funds, and at the time a very small practice of hedge funds. And so I covered a few hedge funds. And I had heard through the grapevine that they were looking to add someone onto the, uh, the investment team at Permal. And so I called uh, Isaac Swade. Isaac is currently our CEO. At the time, he was our CFO, and Tom DeLillo, who was, who was our chief operating officer. And I said, you know, I'd like to throw my hat into the ring. You've known me for a number of years. I've done the audit, and uh, I hear you're looking for someone on the investment side. And they said, absolutely, come in and interview. And one of the nice things about it was that the culture here was to hire former accountants. Isaac is a former accountant, uh, Tom DeLillo was our chief operating officer, was a former CPA. Uh, Jim Hodge, who was our CEO for no, a CIO for a number of years, was also a, a former CPA. And so there was a culture here of hiring accountants. And so I interviewed for the job and 15 years later, here I am. Rob, as you yourself had a background in accounting, tell me about the importance to Permal of hiring people with accounting backgrounds. I think accountants approach the things with a healthy amount of skepticism. And so, unlike the accountants of the newer days where you had the Enron uh, fiascos, is when we did an audit, and whether it's Isaac or myself, is that we really rolled up our shirt sleeves and understood the, not just the numbers, but the qualitative factors behind those numbers. And so, I think there's a, a definitively a, a benefit of, of this accounting background just a bit based upon how you approach things with this healthy amount of skepticism. You know, one of the things I've noticed in the hedge fund industry is that when I come across hedge fund managers, you'd be surprised how many of them have started their careers working as an accountant. I think that's, a, that's just always a, a connection that I have with a lot of managers is, is, a, is their uh, background as, as a former CPA. What are some of the philosophies and process differentiators that separate per mile from other fund of hedge funds? In doing this as long as we have, no matter how much the environment changes, what we do and certain core philosophies that we have will always remain the same. I think that we have many core philosophies that we've developed, again, being in this business for so many years, but if I were to highlight a, a couple, I'll start off with one that is that I think differentiates us from other firms is that I do fervently believe in diversification. In our portfolios, I think you'll see more managers and more names than in other portfolios. And there's a reason for that, is that we have a saying at Permal, and it's that, it's that it's not what a manager can do for you, it's what a manager can do to you. And as we all know, hedge funds have, it's not a normal return distribution. Hedge fund returns have fat tails. They are accident prone. They do make mistakes. Funds come in the business and they go out of business. And so I think more managers make sense for a hedge fund of funds portfolio. Now some may argue that well, too many managers, you're not finding enough talent, and I wholeheartedly disagree. 
there's maybe 10,000 hedge fund managers out there. I think that's what the industry quotes. And if you say that 5% of them are any good, well, that leaves you 500 managers to choose from. We're using 165 managers or 170 managers. So I think there's plenty of a talent to choose from, from, especially when you're doing this on a global basis like we are, that you can build a quality portfolio and still have the diversification benefits. The second area that I think differentiates us is that we are very focused on both the qualitative factors and the quantitative factors. And I think a lot of people focus mostly on the quantitative statistics. And I think qualitative factors have led a lot of investors, or led us, to avoid a lot of the blow-ups in the industry. In fact, that's one of the benefits of having that CPA background, is just understanding the qualitative factors behind the quantitative factors. People always ask me, what's the first thing I look at when I look at a manager? And for a lot of people, it's performance. In fact, that's the last thing I look at. The first thing I look at is biographies. I want to understand where they work, what their experiences are. I'll also look at the strategy. I uh, will look at trade examples. I do out-of-sample reference checks. And then finally, I get to the performance information. But I think the key in this industry is that if people would focus more on the qualitative factors, you can uncover a lot of the frauds that have happened in this industry and not just focusing on the quantitative. Rob, with $23 billion under management and 165 different managers with whom you invest, how big is your investment team that does the due diligence and researches this universe of managers? So the firm has 190 employees, of which 40 of them are dedicated to the investment management and the investment management process. Of the 40, I would break them down to three groups, the investment team, operational due diligence, and risk management. The vast majority of them sit on the investment team, whether they're portfolio managers, analysts, investment strategists, and there's about 30 people on that team. There are six people in our operational due diligence group responsible of going to see all of our managers from an operational standpoint. And then we have four people dedicated to risk management. Rob, since the financial crisis, fund of hedge funds have had to adapt to new investor needs. How has Permal adapted? Investor demands and expectations are much higher than they've ever been, and not necessarily in a bad way. For a fund of funds, I think the, the key for a fund of funds in, in this environment is that every day you have to show your value. How do you add value? What's your value proposition to just being a passive investor? And so one of the things I've noticed over the last few years is that the world has become much more correlated because of globalization. And so what you've seen world economies become much more correlated, which has led to equity markets have been much more correlated. But not just it doesn't stop at equity markets. You've seen hedge funds and hedge fund strategies become much more correlated. So every day you have to be different or show a differentiated view. And so we've been very focused on that in the last couple of years. For the last few years, I think there have been two areas that we focused on in showing a differentiated position. The first is in, in creating our separate account platform where we go and invest in a manager as opposed to investing in this commingled fund, we invest in a separate account with that manager. And the second is what I like to call being an opportunistic or an activist investor, which is where you find the little spaces in the industry where you can extract a little extra value for our, for our clients. Permal is one of the industry's largest separately managed account platforms at over $6 billion. Can you talk about the value of separately managed accounts right now and what Permal is doing in this regard? Let me first start by defining our, our separate account platform. And, and this is where we set up a separate account with a manager as opposed to investing in this commingled vehicle. And there are many benefits to having a separate account as opposed to investing in the commingled vehicle. Obviously, the, the biggest benefit is, is that it has guaranteed liquidity. Problems that the industry saw in 2008, whether it's gating, side pocketing, suspensions of NAVs, they become a non-issue when you're invested in a separate account. You have guaranteed liquidity as, as an investor. And I think our investor base really likes that. Another benefit of, of the separate account is that we have daily transparency into each of the manager's portfolios, which becomes very beneficial to understand the manager's risks, his exposures, and then we can adjust our portfolios uh, accordingly. A third benefit of being invested in a separate account is it allows us to do dynamic asset allocation. And then if you're invested in a commingled fund, 
you're only allowed entry points and exit points once a month, sometimes once a quarter, even sometimes once a year. But with a, a separate account, you have constant en entry and exit points. You know, the best example I, I can give you, and it's a recent example, was in the middle of March when the uh, earthquake and tsunami happened in Japan and Japanese equity markets sold off 20% in the first two weeks of March. We added to our Japanese exposure because we thought things had gotten overdone. Now, if you were just invested in commingled vehicles, you can't add that exposure and you would actually have to wait till the end of the month and you have lost down some very attractive returns. And so uh, in terms of dynamic asset allocation, the separate accounts really give us an added benefit. The fourth benefit of, of the separate accounts is, uh, is reduced fees. I think a lot of managers have a hard time giving a fee discount on their commingled share class, or on a commingled fund, but if you're invested in a separate account, they're able to give you a fee discount, and again, that, gets, that benefit gets passed along to our, to our investors. The last benefit of a separate account is customization, and this is one of my uh, favorite benefits, is that we get a manager to do something that's specific to us that's consistent with our, our top-down views. So sometimes we've had separate accounts that have been customized to uh, increase leverage. We don't think a manager is taking enough risk. We increase the leverage on the account. And uh, we've had several situations where we've asked managers to do that. They've been very pleased with the results, and they've gone out to their shareholders and offered a levered class to their fund. Another way we customize our separate accounts is by having managers run more concentrated portfolios. As I mentioned earlier, is we believe in diversification, and so we have very diversified portfolios, which then allows our managers to run much more concentrated portfolios. And again, we've had managers offer this, or we've, we've constructed portfolios like this, where they've gone and said, hey, this works, let me go out and offer this to my client. When we see a very short-lived specific opportunity that the manager sees as well as, our, as well as our investment team sees and that we're able to quickly deploy assets within that separate account to capture that opportunity. You know, a perfect example was in the summer of 2007 when merger arb spreads blew out. We talk to one of our event-driven managers and say, hey, we think these deals are going to close. The manager happens to agree. I think there's some very attractive returns to be achieved here. Let's launch a separate account just to invest in those merger up spreads, betting that they would collapse, and that's exactly what happened. And so we do happen to like when we see those specific opportunities that are short-lived and we're able to rapidly launch a separate account to capitalize. One of the things that we've noticed over the last few years is that alpha evaporates much more quickly than it ever has. And so the separate account platform allows us to face this phenomenon in a couple of different ways. The first way is that it allows us to re-engineer a separate account with a manager to find the best alpha opportunities around. I remember in coming out of the financial crisis in 2009, one of our long short equity managers had seen a great opportunity in the credit markets. And he wanted to allocate about 20% of his portfolio to credit trades. Now the problem was that was in violation of his investment restrictions. So he had to go to all the shareholders and ask for their permission. And this created a shareholder revolt and people weren't happy. Well, we had a separate account and we said absolutely. And if you notice that uh, our separate account, and this is just one instance, had vastly outperformed his fund because we were able to capitalize on that credit trade, which we couldn't do in, the, in a commingled vehicle. The, the second way that we deal with evaporating alpha is again going back to this dynamic asset allocation. When we see the alpha declining in a portfolio or a portfolio manager or, or in a theme, we're able to quickly redeploy those assets into a, another separate account or another manager where we see a better alpha opportunities. And some situations where we just think the, ma the, the manager has lost his ability to generate alpha, we, we terminate the manager. I, I think some people think that with the separate accounts, it's that um, you know, because it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to launch them that we're much more wed or we lose our objectivity and, and that's clearly not the case. Is we turn over our separate accounts just as much as we do commingled vehicles and uh, we hold all of our managers to the same standards. So Rob, tell me a little bit more about opportunistic investing and what you see right now, and how to be opportunistic right now. Buying any asset class is highly 
specialized in nature. And if one just passively invests, they're probably not going to get the returns that they think they would get or they're expecting to get. Uh, I think the best example of that is what happened during the last decade for equities. If you think back to the beginning of the decade coming out of the tech bubble, is that the investment community was saying, don't be an active investor, just by the, the index of the S&P 500. And if you look at what happened over that last, uh, over that last decade is investors actually lost money. And so you clearly have to be, passive investing to me does not work, and you clearly have to be an active investor. I think being an active investor takes many shapes and forms, and it's not just one specific trade. It's, it's lots of different themes, but it all comes down to one central principle. It's that knowing the industry, you just know where the opportunities are to make additional money or additional profits uh, for our investors. And so we try and, we try and do that uh, uh, quite regularly. If I could touch on just a couple of examples of where we found opportunities to make money for our clients, the first one has been in the co-investment space. And that's with managers that we know, that we know well, that we have deep relationships with that will give us an opportunity to invest side by side with them in something that may be less liquid but clearly not illiquid. As an example, it may be a post-reorg equity that is coming out of bankruptcy that you may have a restriction on, or it may be a pre-IPO equity. And again, managers may, be, ha may have too much exposure in their portfolio and so they'll allow you to get in on their terms directly as a co-investment opportunities. And very frequently, just based upon the relationships that we have, is that you could do this at, at zero fees to, to our clients, which is, uh, which is, again, adds more value to our end investors. So another area that we've been quite active in, in terms of adding value to our clients, has been in being an early stage investor. I think there's a lot of talent out there, and this comes from a number of reasons. Over the last couple of years, a lot of well-known hedge funds have closed down. These are, t these are firms that have had deep benches and deep teams, and it's created this diaspora of investment talent. You also have the Volcker Rule, which has eliminated prop trading from the banks, and so you're seeing a lot of prop traders leave the banks and start to form hedge funds. One of the things that I've been noticing is that I think there's, there's more supply than there is demand for these new startups. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to extrapolate terms. It allows us to extrapolate a separate account. It allows us to extrapolate a discount on the fees, perhaps a revenue share, perhaps equity in the management firm. But all those added benefits, again, go to the benefit of our investors. And so we've been very active in the seeding and early stage investing space. And then another area that I particularly like for uh, creating alpha for our investors is the secondary market. I've been one of the uh, earliest investors in the secondary market. In fact, there's a, there's a well-known firm that most people probably know in the industry. They were the, the first intermediary for secondary hedge fund shares. And in this first transaction, I was on one side of the transaction, which actually worked out very well for us. And I remember early on, when I was talking to a peer of mine at another fund of funds firm, telling him about the secondary market and how I was buying shares at a discount to NAV, and I remember this colleague or this peer actually sneered at me. He could not believe that I was actually doing this in the secondary market. It was, it was against his morals or whatever it may be. And, and I just thought to myself, great, you buy at NAV and I'll buy at a discount to NAV, the same, the same hedge fund. And chances are I'm either further along in my lockup or I get a benefit of a high watermark carryover, but I just couldn't believe it. The secondary markets has become a lot more complicated. I think there's a lot more players, whether it's intermediaries or people still... Uh, other investors realize the opportunity. It goes back to what I said earlier about how alpha evaporates quickly. But if you do your homework and you roll up your shirt sleeves, there's still plenty of things to buy at good value at deep discounts to NAV. And so, again, we look for, for opportunities in that market. We've been very successful there as well.